Hey everyone, uh, this is Noah Diffenbaugh at Stanford University, and I'm very excited uh, to host this Hangout on Air. Uh, we're going to be talking today about climate change and extreme weather. Uh, that's our, our point of departure for the discussion. Um, there was a, a big a census report released this week by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, that uh, focused on how uh, global warming uh, has been influencing uh, extreme weather events and also how it may uh, continue to influence extreme weather events in the future. Uh, this is one of the primary areas of my research, uh, so I wanted to uh, give an opportunity uh, to have a discussion about, about climate change and extreme weather. Uh, I, I do want to say at the outset that uh, I am a, a uh, lead author for the IPCC's fifth assessment report uh, that's in process now. I was not an author of this uh, special report on extremes that has just been released. And anything that I say uh, here in the Hangout or otherwise is, is my own opinion, my own view, my own understanding, and does not reflect the position of the IPCC uh, or of Stanford University for that matter. All right, we have a number, number of people uh, in the Hangout now, so uh, I'd like to invite them to go down uh, the line here as it appears on the bottom of the screen and uh, introduce themselves, starting with Billy. Hi, I'm Billy Wilson. I'm from Sioux City, Marie, Ontario, Canada. Um, I have a bachelor's in chemistry and biology and I'm pretty interested in, in, in ecology and the environment. Um, I mainly focus on fine art that nowadays, but... Uh, that's, that's pretty well me. Hi, I'm Carlos Ochoa. I am the Interim Director of the Office for Campus Sustainability at the University of Arkansas, and my institution is a signatory of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, so I'm definitely excited to hear what you have to say today, Noah. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, very interesting. Thanks. Uh, I'm James Salzman. I'm interested in high altitude tethered wind and fuel synthesis. I've been interested in uh, extreme weather for uh, seven or eight years now. All right, we got the Waterloo duo. <laughs> uh, so my name is Jason Davison. I'm a PhD student um, at the University of Waterloo in uh, Ontario, Canada. And um, I focus on coupling an uh, atmospheric uh, model and a uh, hydrology model. And uh, my name is John Lynn. I'm a um, faculty member here at University of Waterloo, and I focus on the uh, exchange between the land surface and the atmosphere of greenhouse gases and uh, different pollutants. Hi, I'm Kate Creasy. I'm a postdoc at Cold Spring Harbor. My PhD is in genetics, a particular branch of epigenetics, so that's how the environment affects gene expression or the organism, but without affecting the DNA. So very much interested in environmental conditions and how that can affect us and plants. All right. I'm, I'm very in inspired by, by such a uh, diverse and um, intelligent group of people. So I'm, I'm really excited about the conversation. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just start with a little bit of an introduction about climate change and extreme weather um, and uh, global warming in general. So. Uh, we, uh, as, as humans, uh, have understood uh, the, the energy balance of planet Earth uh, for some time, for going back um, uh, really into the, the late 19th century. Um, and uh, the reality is that uh, given how much energy is coming in from the sun, uh, striking uh, the top of Earth's atmosphere, uh, we need a greenhouse effect in order to maintain the uh, habitable, pleasant conditions that we have on planet Earth. Uh, so if we just take the amount of, of uh, solar energy that's coming in, uh, there's really not enough to keep uh, Earth, the water on Earth from being frozen. So the greenhouse effect is, is really helping us. It's helping me here in my uh, pleasant environment in California. Um, uh, so uh, I have nothing against the greenhouse effect. Um, and uh, the, the amount of energy uh, from the sun that's coming onto, onto Earth is not evenly distributed. So the equator receives a lot more uh, direct energy than, that, than the poles. 
And basically all the weather that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives is the result of this energy imbalance. Uh, and as greenhouse gas concentrations increase, uh, the, the amount of energy going into that system, uh, this whole climate system increases. And what we're trying to understand is how uh, that weather that we experience, uh, and particularly the extremes of, of uh, weather, uh, respond to this increase in, in the energy input that comes from the increasing greenhouse gas concentrations. Uh, so that's the, the short summary. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions about um, particular issues in, in climate change and extreme weather. Um, and we can start there. And if, if we deviate, that's fine with me as well. Uh, so are there any questions at this time? Yeah, um, Noah? Yes. Um, well, I'm looking at the new report right now in the IPCC. And uh, something that I was hoping that you could kind of expand upon is in one, the very first paragraph, the last sentence, it says, uh, well, the two last sentences, some strategies for effectively managing risks and adapting to climate change involve adjustments to current activities. Others require transformation or fundamental change. What, what are they talking about when they say requires transformation or fundamental change? Well, that's a great question, uh, and, and much of the report is focused on uh, this combination of uh, the, the climate events themselves, the exposure of, say, human, uh, human uh, people, society, infrastructure uh, to, those, to those events, and uh, also the vulnerability uh, that, that uh, can regulate how much damage occurs from an individual event. Uh, so much of the report is focused on the overlay of those three dimensions. So one way to think about it is, is like the, the, uh, the tree falling in the woods. Right? So if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Um, if, if a tornado happens uh, uh, in the Great Plains over, over the prairie and nothing's there to get hit by it, uh, is that a disaster? Um, you can have exactly the same tornado, and if it if it uh, comes through a town and and levels all the buildings, then that's a disaster. So that overlay between the physical event and the human dimension is what really shapes uh, these weather disasters from a those that are disasters from a human perspective. Uh, so that's really what's what's being targeted in that in that statement. Um, there might be there might be kind of um, adjustments that we can make in how we uh, how we go about our day-to-day -day lives that could help to buffer us against uh, extreme events in the in the present climate and in a different climate. And um, an example of that could be uh, warning systems. And so just uh, having a siren. Um, I used to live out in, in the Midwest in Indiana, and you know, we had a siren in our in our town in West Lafayette, Indiana, and uh, that uh, when when there was a, a potential uh, severe thunderstorm spotted, the siren would go off, and and um, then it becomes a question of what the human decision to do about that is. But uh, having that having that warning system can really decrease uh, the damage from say the same tornado that that could be disastrous without that without that warning. Uh, so that's an example of where where possible adjustments could be made to, to uh, deal with, with um, increasing severe thunderstorms, for example. Uh, then the other half of that statement is focused on the um, kind of more fundamental changes that, that might be necessary. So uh, for example, with, with coastal development, we have a, a huge fraction of our, of our population and um, urban infrastructure is focused on in coastal areas, and uh, the damage from um, from severe storms in those coastal areas uh, uh, is influenced by the sea level. Uh, so the storm surge combined with with the sea level uh, really can create uh, very large damage during during extreme events. So if sea level rises uh, sufficiently to uh, increase the, the, uh, the areas that would be damaged for 
a given extreme storm event, then that might be an example where something more fundamental could be needed. Uh, so I'm not advocating for this, but people do actually consider what would the cost uh, of relocation be um, for coastal urban areas. And there are, there are areas that are developing plans uh, to deal with sea level rise, both from that, the inundation of the sea level rise, but also from the perspective of increasing storminess and, and the exposure of, of the current infrastructure. Um, does that help to answer your question? All right, are there other questions at this time? Uh, so this has been um, this has been a very uh, costly um, year in the United States uh, in terms of the the number of uh, billion dollar weather disasters, and uh, that's a, that those weather disasters are another example of how um, how the physical climate system and the human dimension uh, overlays to to create uh, the the damage that that we experience. So. Um, if we have if we have uh, trends in development uh, in infrastructure, uh, we could have exactly the same frequency of of floods, for example, of tornadoes, and see increasing damage. So there's a real a real question of when we have a year like this, uh, like's happened in the U.S., uh, how much of that um, that damage is is from uh, a change in the in the climate system and how much is that is from uh, the, the human dimension and so if I may interject yes please um, how many of those extreme weather conditions were predicted uh, for example like there's a hurricane heads up for 2012 now out and my question comes down to the idea that if, if there are predicted extreme weather conditions one takes preventative measures so the the idea of transforming or, or you know trying to make sure that current procedures are, are improved upon when we know we have to prepare for something, hurricanes for example, versus something that is completely and utterly like, not predictable or, or not seen and it's been an extreme uh, situation that the, the world or the, the place it was occurring couldn't handle. Um, do you think they're sort of rising over the number of years with all the kind of changes to the climate and what mankind are doing to the planet? Or do you think we're having the same sort of number of natural disasters or acts of God? So that's a that's a great question. Um, so in terms of the the question about predictability, uh, it's really important to consider both time scale and space space scale spatial scale. Um, so the the short term weather forecasts are actually quite good. And in the case of Hurricane Katrina, for example, um, you know the, the it was clear three days in advance that uh, there was a very high likelihood that Katrina was going to make landfall uh, quite close to New Orleans. Um, and so, so from a prediction point of view, uh, there certainly was uh, a sufficiently reliable prediction far enough in advance, um, just from, a, from the statistical perspective. Uh, if, if we are, if we want to know what's the likelihood um, now, if we're, if we're asking the question now on, on April 6, what's the likelihood that a, that a hurricane will make landfall uh, close to New Orleans uh, in September of this year uh, or on September 6 of this year? Then it becomes a much more difficult question that frankly is, is uh, beyond the, the limits of predictability uh, in the real world. Um, and so how we, how we uh, manage uh, those unknowns uh, is, is important. And I think that you know, part of your question has to do with you know, what time and space scales are we, are we talking about prediction. Uh, there are certainly uh, some very robust um, scientific results in terms of how extreme events respond to elevated greenhouse forcing. And that was the other part of your question. Um, have there been changes in extremes, and, and are these are these changes due to uh, human activities? So we know that the intensity of rainfall um, has been increasing as a general as a, as a general trend, and this uh, agrees very much with uh, theoretical predictions of of rainfall. That, um, as the atmosphere warms, uh, there's more water vapor 
as a result, that water vapor is closer to saturation, and when there's a convective trigger, then more uh, rain will will fall out. And that that uh, prediction has been confirmed by by observations uh, many many times over. Um, if we talk about tornadoes, it's it's much more difficult uh, to answer that question about what have the changes been. Um, partly from because it's so difficult to observe them. I mean, so uh, the observing system has been has been changing through time uh, for tornadoes. Uh, so we don't even really have a, a uniform record of, of tornado occurrence uh, going back uh, for many decades uh, as we do for temperature records, for example. Um, also the you know over the length of of, of time that we would that we would like to have records, uh, we've gone from you know having people observe observe tornadoes to also having radar, uh, and in fact the number of um, the number of tornado reports uh, uh, in terms of the trends over over say the U.S. or regions of the U.S. Uh, looks very much like population. Uh, so if we if we overlay the number of tornado reports and the population given area, then then they match uh, quite closely. Uh, so, so with tornadoes, it's you know, we we uh, we have a long ways to go um, before we'll be able to answer the the the, the mm. question that you're asking. Sorry, that was well, kind of one example because of the fact that I could see a recent post about you know how there was only four storms in 1983 and and many more now, but. Really, if we're trying to indicate that climate change, or well, that humanity is having a significant impact on the Earth and, and extreme weather conditions, surely we need, in a way, people are becoming a little bit more on board with that concept and being greener and recycling and treating the planet better. If there was this whole concept of action-reaction, and if the extreme weather conditions that are now being seen around the world are just because pe more people are there to see them, I don't think it's the right argument to try and get people to care about what they do with the planet more. Well, so I think um, language is important, right? So extreme weather weather conditions and extreme weather disasters are, are they're, they're different. Um, and the, the, you only have an extreme weather disaster if, if there are people there uh, to suffer the disaster, that just by definition. So um, we actually have an easier time answering the question about extreme weather conditions than we do about extreme weather disasters, but there are people working really hard on, on both of those areas. Um, you know, in terms of, in terms of extreme weather conditions, I think tornadoes are, 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 uh, and are, are the biggest challenge and hurricanes are also, are also quite challenging and there's a lot of contention about, um, about even the physical responses uh, in both of those, uh, for both of those kinds of events. Um, for for uh, heat waves, for example, um, we've we observed temperature really well. We've been observing temperature really well for a long time, and it's very clear that that uh, extreme temperature events have been increasing in in uh, frequency and in uh, severity, and that that is uh, right in line with with uh, what we would predict from our theoretical understanding. So I, I, I think it depends on what kind of extreme event. Uh, in general, uh, the temperature extremes uh, we we understand better than precipitation extremes, um, but we understand these these really highly localized extreme storms uh, the least of those. Does that help to answer cool. your question at all? Um, Someone else was about to speak. Oh, sorry. Was there was there another question? Yeah, I had a question actually. I just wanted to know in terms of the predictive models, what do the predictive models uh, state in terms of the increase in these um, either extreme events um, that we've talked about? For uh, what do they predict for the future or uh, if, we, if we run them over the historical yeah, period, uh, what would they have predicted for, uh, for the historical period? Well, both, because my understanding is that, you know, you have a pretty clear understanding with temperature changes, for instance, because the changes that we've observed and because we have a better track record correspond with the models, so uh, with what would have been predicted by the models. Um, it's less so the case with tornadoes, for instance, and other extreme events. So I'm just wondering to what extent those other extreme events are predicted by the models, so if we, you know, have something to track against or not. Absolutely. Um, 
So with temperature, for instance, we could ask um, what was the hottest summer that occurred in the second half of the 20th century and uh, how often uh, do we expect that to occur uh, with, uh, in the future if, if greenhouse gas concentrations continue to increase. And uh, so we actually have, have run that analysis. Um, and, and, and those models uh, make the prediction of uh, increasing occurrence of that historical hot extreme. Um, and the, the tropical uh, parts of the globe actually show the most immediate uh, transition uh, to this very frequent, you know, kind of normal, normal extreme conditions. Um, and the mid-latitudes uh, show the second, the second uh, fastest emergence, and the high latitudes show the, show the latest emergence. And a lot of that really has to do with how variable uh, temperatures are from year to year. And we can talk about the details of that if you're interested. Um, but as part of that study, we also looked back in time and we said, if we, if we um, take the recent period as you know, what we might call the future, right? if, we had, if we had run the experiment back in, in the 50s and 60s uh, and looked at, at the late 20th century as the future, did what actually happened in reality, um, how did that compare to what the models uh, project for that period? And um, in fact, the, the, the observations actually agree quite closely with, um, with, what the models, uh, with what the models show. And that's, I mean, we've known that for global mean temperature for a long time, but in this case, we were looking at, in, in different regions of the globe, at uh, the, the hottest season that occurred, so the really m most severe heat. And in fact, uh, the increase in, um, in area experiencing that, that extreme heat that the models uh, predicted would happen actually is, is seen in the observation. So that's, that's one example. Does that help to answer the question? Yeah, it does, but I think that, um, I guess my question is that the uh, predictive models uh, apparently have been uh, vindicated to some extent in terms of temperature and precipitation. But to what extent do the predictive models deal with the other extreme events, such okay. as you know tornadoes and the other events that we talked about? Right. So, so uh, we've done we've done some work on uh, tornadoes in the United States, and um, and basically the you know, a tornado needs um, it needs some energy uh, for the storm um, that in the in the form of heat and moisture, and it also needs wind shear, and so a uh, difference in the in the direction of winds uh, near the surface and up in the atmosphere, and that that wind shear causes the uplift and rotation that creates a, a severe thunderstorm and, and potentially a tornado. Um, so so for a tornado to form, it requires both of those conditions, uh, ingredients, if you will. And uh, there have been kind of thought experiments run. Uh, about both of those conditions. So if you, if you just think about you know, the fundamental physics, we'd expect um, over the parts of the U.S. that, that get tornadoes now, we'd, we'd expect that the uh, energy would increase during the warm season, um, with a, a warmer, wetter atmosphere. Uh, but for the, for the wind shear, we actually expect uh, from, physical, from physical arguments, we'd expect that wind shear to decrease as uh, the storm tracks shift uh, northward, and we can talk about um, we can talk about the physics of that. But basically, b before we did the modeling, that there was kind of this theoretical argument um, between these two ingredients, or people arguing about these two these two ingredients. And so uh, there hasn't been a lot of modeling done in this area, but the modeling that we've done uh, suggests that the, that increase in the energy in the atmosphere is likely to overwhelm the decreases in shear and create more frequent severe thunderstorm events uh, in the United States. Uh, and we've looked at this in the United States as a whole, and we've also looked in, in different regions. And um, basically, the increasing moisture in the atmosphere in combination with the, the increasing temperature um, is, is enough to, to overcome the, the decreases in that, in that wind shear to, to increase the the total seasonal occurrence of, of severe thunderstorm environments. Uh, is that helpful? 
That's great. Thanks. Uh, th this may kind of be a little bit of a stretch of that, but the idea of using, was it solar panel generators in the desert and basically having to keep the air vents free of dust and clean, but the moisture in the air. So there's going to be people trying to put more moisture in the air to make sure the desert is a hospitable environment enough to have the solar panels for the solar energy. That's correct. What um, are we going to show yeah, so yeah, so we, uh, there is some attention, including, including a project that, that we have here at Stanford, around um, trying to understand what the, what the side effects of large-scale solar energy production could be. Um, and we expect that, you know, there'll be, there'll be a focus on sunny areas for, for solar panels. Um, but but uh, that, 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 that there's no rule about that. Um, so the, I mean, the areas that you'd expect solar panels to go into uh, in terms of the solar input are not the most frequent um, uh, severe thunderstorm areas in the United States uh, for, for actually for the, same, for the same physical reasons in terms of the atmospheric dynamics. Um, but there is a question in terms of the solar, the solar question in particular, is a, there is a question about you know, how much alteration of the land surface uh, can occur uh, without alterate, altering the local and, and regional climate. And actually, this is, these kinds of fluxes are the, the kinds of things that the water, water the group is, is thinking about. I don't, do you guys have anything to say about that in terms of the surface-atmosphere interactions? Well, um, we're, we're starting to look at uh, that issue, uh, mainly in Ontario, just from the uh, urbanization, the, the, the vast sort of uh, alteration of the landscape. And, and that you know, as you said, Noah, the basically alters the energy balance and uh, could have feedback effects on the circulation as well. So it's, 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 it's still a work in progress, so I don't have a clear answer. But, but it's, there have been many pieces of work done by many people um, showing actually land use to be very important, many times overwhelming the greenhouse effect at a really local or regional scale. And so this raises a really... Um a really interesting issue about um, kind of the, the global climate, the continental scale climate, the regional climate, the local climate. I mean, we're, we're so much of what we do um, in our day-to-day -day lives influences the local fluxes uh, of, of energy and moisture. Um, we're, we're, uh, it doesn't appear that we're going to stop um, altering the land surface uh, and so what scale uh, constitutes uh, change uh, and how we value those different, those different scales uh, in terms of where we place our emphasis on change, I think, is, is a really interesting question uh, like you raised. I don't know if you have any, any thoughts about that. But certainly you could have, um, you know, when, when uh, in, in climate policy that there are there's a lot of discussion of incentives for land-based sequestration of carbon. And, you know, if we add up, um, you know, the, 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 the carbon that would be stored in some plantation, that, that means something for the global atmospheric concentration, but it means something potentially very different for the local and regional climate of that, of that area. Um, and, and they don't necessarily go in the same direction. So some carbon sequestration in a forestry project could you know, incrementally cause a cooling by lowering the greenhouse gas concentrations a little bit, but could cause a warming of, of that area where the, where the plantation is by altering how much solar radiation gets absorbed, how much, um, what, what the moisture fluxes are. Uh, so, I, you know, in terms of um, these trade-offs of, of, of uh, solutions, uh, it, it really does matter what, what we're optimizing in terms of what, how, how the analysis of the trade-offs comes out. I think, I think, Bill, you raised a really good point on the scale question, and uh, um, that sort of no one really cares about mean temperature. <laughs> uh, I mean, mean temperature is just sort of a, some some average quantity we can get out of the model. So, as human society, we all care about some of the regional or the local that that has a more immediate impact on societal issues. So, I'm, I'm sort of curious as a as an author in the latest report. Unfortunately, I haven't had time to read it. Um, I know there's much more 
effort now in this latest report to look at regional scales, whereas some of the earlier reports was more global in scale. Can you just comment on some of the the newest results that's been shed on on the latest report on some of the regional scale issues? Some of the new findings that have come out in the latest report. Uh, yeah, so there's there's certainly been uh, a lot of research in the last um, decade and certainly in the last several years on uh, how how regional and potentially local scale climate responds to uh, this this global scale change in the in the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. And you know if we're if we're talking about extremes, then that that's really where where the rubber hits the road is um, where where those extreme events occur. And as you say, we don't we don't live in the global mean temperature. We don't live in the in the seasonal the seasonal mean temperature precipitation even even locally, we, we live in what we what we experience um, on a day to day basis, and it really is those those extremes where we really, uh, in many cases, feel the climate system most um, most directly. Um, so I think you know that the we see a lot of, of heterogeneity certainly, uh, and and it, it is difficult to make generalizations uh, as we get to smaller and smaller. Uh, spatial scales and, and smaller and smaller time scales, um, but uh, certainly the uh, the the result of of um, the the tropics um, moving into a novel temperature space most immediately. I think this is a new result that's come out just in the last couple of years, and it's been cor corroborated in a number of different studies, um, although I, I should say using, using similar data sets. But um, you know, there has been this, this, um, this uh, view that the, the high latitudes are kind of the canary in the coal mine because uh, they've been showing this, this uh, amplified warming, what's called polar amplification. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons that that, that, that high latitude temperature um, change in, and precipitation changes could have very important impacts. So I don't want to um, I don't want to decrease the importance of of that uh, polar perspective at all. But I think something that has emerged in terms of the regional climate change is that because the tropical year to year variability is so much lower, it really requires less less mean warming to to really increase the frequency of of extreme temperatures. And um, this that we had this paper come out. Uh, last summer, where we actually we asked the question of how how quickly might different parts of the world move into uh, a totally novel temperature space where every summer that they experience is hotter than what was the hottest uh, summer of the of the late 20th century. Uh, so completely moving into into an extreme an extreme temperature space, and uh, there are large areas of the tropics that. That exhibit at least a, a 50% likelihood of of moving into that that kind of temperature regime within the next couple of decades. Um, but I also heard that it was associated with the Earth's orbit around the Sun and how over so many you know 10, 1500 years or whatever that usually there's an orbit that allows those things to occur anyway. Well, well, so so yeah, so the Sun is the Sun is really important for climate. <laughs> there's no doubt about <laughs> that. Um, it's 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 why we it's why we uh, why we have climate. It's why we have um, the hospitable climate that we do have in combination with the greenhouse effect. Um, and the sun varies varies on a number of different time scales. Uh, it varies on on pretty short time scales. And we, you know, I read just as a as a citizen, I read these stories in the in the newspaper about how um, uh, you know I, maybe my cell phone coverage or or credit card. Transmissions are going to be interrupted by some solar activity. Um, it varies on an 11-year cycle that's 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 relatively consistent um, as well. And so there there is there is a more consistent um, that decadal periodicity in terms of how much energy we're getting from the sun. And then the other the other aspect that's important is Earth's orbit, as you mentioned. So. We're orbiting around the sun. Um, it's it's a pretty circular orbit, but it is it is elliptical, and the and how elliptical it is varies. Um, so that's what's called the eccentricity of the orbit, and and that that eccentricity varies uh, on about a hundred thousand year time scale. 
Um, the, the tilt of the Earth on its axis also varies. So uh, how, how tilted we are um, goes back and forth um, on about a 40,000-year time scale. That's, that's called the obliquity of the orbit. And then uh, there's also the precession that varies on about a 20,000-year time scale. So uh, precession is, I think, most people find to be the least intuitive of these. But if you, if you spin a top, um, it'll spin on its axis, but that axis will also wobble. Um, and so that, the wobble of that axis affects how much uh, energy is coming into the year system from the sun in different parts of the year relative to that obliquity and that eccentricity. So those are long time scale uh, variations. And um, we do know that those, that those variations are what pace the ice ages, for example, um, and temperature variations, longer term variations within the ice ages. Uh, and in fact, this has been, this has been a, um, a relatively long interglacial period. Right? So uh, we've spent most of the last, Earth has spent most of the last uh, almost 3 million years uh, with uh, large continental ice sheets. And it's been punctuated by by these periods where the ice recedes. And um, Indiana, for example, where I used to live, is no longer covered in ice. It's now, it's now um, covered in a beautiful Midwestern landscape. Um, and that, that's because of those orbital variations. And, and in fact, it has been a long, a long period without, without uh, a lot of ice in North America. And there is some discussion about the role that, that human um, greenhouse gas emissions have played in, in preventing an ice age, uh, which Isn't is Russia not hoping, a topic. Sorry, go ahead, Kate. All parts of Russia hoping for the similar effect, though. Uh, what do you mean, hoping? Well, they hope for basically greenhouse gases, global warming, to allow them to have sustainability of their land once the snow melts. But at least that keeps water levels up for other things, I guess. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess I should, I should really make clear that I'm not, um, I'm just speaking for myself, um, I'm agnostic about, about costs or benefits of, of climate change or um, good or bad, right? I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's an enormous amount of work to uh, try to, as you know, as a scientist, right, just to, to try to do, to understand how the world works and, and to do that as objectively as possible um, and, and to really try to, try to push the limits of our understanding, but also make sure that we're right. Um, and that, that's, that's all consuming. So, um, you know, I, I think we have a lot of examples where, well, I, know, I know that we have a lot of examples where there are um, potential benefits of, of warming in general, uh, but also of, of potential benefits even where we, if we do kind of the impacts assessment of what, um, you know, what climate change, you know, our best understanding of these kind of local and regional climate changes that were mentioned, um, when we do those impacts assessments, there are, there are potential, potential benefits. That doesn't mean that, that capturing those benefits will, uh, will come for free. Um, but that's the kind of work that we're trying to do to, to really objectively, objectively understand uh, what are the physical changes that are likely to occur in different parts of the world? Uh, how might those physical changes affect what we do now? And how might, how might uh, we respond to to those physical changes. So if I may ask again as, as well something I've written already on your post though, some of the, op some of the things that have actually been carried out already to either uh, prevent or to somehow help sustainability of natural resources or natural energy sources, um, how, have they, how have they gone down or what, what went wrong or are they actually, are they working? Do we have any examples? Uh, in terms of like unintended consequences? Is that, is that what you're asking about? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence. Um, and I don't think I'm going out on too much of a limb here, but there, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, our biofuels um, mandates have had side effects, have had environmental side effects. Uh, and those are mostly related to indirect land use change. Uh, so by altering... Um, you know, the, the market for corn, for example, um, by moving, moving corn uh, production from food into 
energy that that there have been adjustments globally in terms of ha how how land is used to make up um, for the change in the agricultural products, um, including including re uh, replacement of soybean um, production that's been displaced by increased corn production. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of important subtleties, but the net effect. Uh, is really pretty clearly emerging now that there's been a net effect of increasing deforestation, increasing carbon emissions um, from the at to the atmosphere, uh, as well as um, you know, the biodiversity impacts. Um, so that's one example where um, where uh, I mean, depending on one's view of of all of the justifications for those biofuel mandates, uh, that that's one example where certainly there have been. Um, you know, the, the effect on the climate system has not been uh, even even necessarily a net uh, positive. Um, I had an, Is a that helpful? question on the. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Euro Maestro. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a follow-up question on, on the solar activity because you mentioned the 11-year cycles, and then I understand that there's a, another sort of super cycle of about I think it's about 400 years, and um, and this relates to the um, sunspot activity, which I guess is at an all-time low, a relative low, uh, since about uh, I think 400 or so. That normally that those periods of very low uh, sunspot uh, count is also um, correlated normally with uh, cooling uh, temperatures and lower temperatures. Um, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, so there are, um, the most famous is this Maunder Minimum uh, that's been associated with the Little Ice Age. Um, and, you know, the Little Ice Age, uh, that's the, you know, capital L, capital I, capital A, you know, it's the, the term that's been um, uh, convention, conventionally given to it. Um, is a period of, of relatively cold temperatures, particularly in Europe. And um, actually, this is this is a, an interesting example, I think, of what we're talking about, you know, uh, benefits of climate change. Um, there has been actual serious academic work uh, analyzing the density of tree rings uh, during this little ice age period. And because it was colder in Europe, the, the tree ring densities were higher. The, the uh, trees grew less in each year, and so much denser wood. And uh, the people that study those tree rings have, have studied uh, the, the wood densities in Stradivarius violins and have actually put forward the hypothesis that part of what contributed to the Stradivarius violins uh, sounding as good as they do uh, was the Little Ice Age, that these, these tree ring, uh, the density of the wood from the cold temperatures created this, this really fantastic wood for making violins. Um, so one one interesting uh, one interesting side story there, um, but I, I don't think we know we, we can know in advance what all the what all the costs and benefits of any warming or cooling will be. Um, but the point is that this 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 period of of low solar activity has been um, associated. This monitor minimum has been has been associated with little ice age, and um, there actually has been because of the the low solar activity that that has been occurring recently. There's been actually quite a bit of attention trying to understand the interaction between increasing greenhouse gases and and solar activity. So not just what what does this 11-year cycle do to climate, but also asking the question: if we had a, a so-called grand minimum um, for a long period of time in, in terms of in terms of the solar output, what kind of um, what kind of climate change would we get from from greenhouse gas concentrations? And actually, there's one interesting paper, kind of taking the maximum um, uh, quiet period for the sun and the minimum uh, of of a, of a number of scenarios for greenhouse gas concentrations. So, asking the least greenhouse warming you could get, the most solar cooling you could get, what would the outcome be? And there's still uh, substantial uh, regional climate change, uh, regional warming, and changes in precipitation that come even from that combination. Is, is that helpful, Euro Maestro? Yeah, that's, that, that's exactly what I was getting at. So it seems that uh, you've answered that question exactly. Excellent. Yeah. Um, no, I think actually there have been a couple studies along those lines. I'm very creative um, 
very creative work. And I, I think that this is, um, you know, I think we're, as scientists, we're not, um, it may appear from the camera that I'm locked in my office, but, um, you know, we're not, we're not in a vacuum and, and um, you know, we have the opportunity to do, do activities like this and, and give public talks and, and uh, you know, interact with, interact with the public in those contexts. Um, and, you know, this often, we often come, come across very interesting scientific questions as a result of hearing what, um, you know, what people in the real world are, are interested in. And, and certainly the emphasis on extreme events that's, that's emerged in the scientific community over the last uh, decade has, has been um, in, in a real substantial way motivated by, by the recognition that that's really what, uh, what people care about and, and what really impacts people. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, to hear what people are interested in and, and, and I hope that that, that, that uh, sparks, sparks uh, creative interest in, in terms of the scientific questions that we're asking. Uh, we've, we've been going for 45 minutes now, so I want to ask if um, does anyone have any, any other questions that they'd, that they'd like to ask during this Hangout on air? All right. Um, well, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us, and uh, I'm I'm going to keep doing these. Um, I am uh, really enjoyed this one, and I'm really excited about about the possibilities. So, uh, if you have uh, questions that that you want to ask, if there are topics that you want to see uh, for future hangouts on air, you want to join future hangouts on air, just um, post a comment plus mention me, and uh, we'll we'll try to get it worked out. So. Thank you all who uh, have been in the Hangout uh, during this, during this uh, last 45 minutes, and, and thank you all uh, for, for viewing this um, online. And I really enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to the next one. So thanks to everyone.